you know, everyone's curious about what William Morris Endeavor is up to. I mean, you've been very active buying companies, investing in companies. Um, you know, it used to be a, a Hollywood agency where you represented actors and to movies and, and uh, television, and that's it. But what are you guys now? Well, I mean, our, our core businesses are still the same. We have, you know, movies, television, music, books, commercials. So that is still uh, the lion's share of our business. And I think <clears throat> the biggest change is basically with content, which everybody in this room knows about, with distribution changing and becoming more commoditized. Content and all types of content become more valuable, and niche content becomes more not, uh, valuable. So um, for us, I think it's created the platform of a talent agency is creating more opportunities for our clients uh, than ever before. So I think that's why there's been kind of a lot of attention recently in our space. Right. Um, you recently said that content is back. Um, you know, I'd like to submit that it never went away. But I think what you were sort of really referring to is that there's this sort of war and tension, um, and many of you are involved in this in this war and this tension um, and complementary in this. Uh, to use a word that doesn't exist, uh, between distribution and content. And at various uh, phases, distribution becomes uh, more um, powerful, um, more, more au courant than content, and then it goes back and forth. Right now, are we seeing a shift where content is ascendant again, and why is that? I think so. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the big players in distribution are, are powerful and continue to be, but I think, you know, you're just seeing so many examples where premium content matters so much to your business and it's a diff it's a way to differentiate yourselves mm -hmm. so you know when you see a company like netflix growing as fast as they are and then having one show really house of cards kind of change people's perception and viewing habits and mm -hmm. looking at them now as a place where you go for original content and uh the way and, and be very similar to the way you look at an hbo or showtime that's really impactful um so whether or not it converted X number of subscribers and all that, which has kind of been up for debate, it's certainly in the way people think about them has changed. And I think that's the power of kind of premium content. And as these disruptive technologies come along, I think that's why it creates more and more opportunity. So yes, I think there will always be this kind of back and forth. But I think in a place where we represent content creators, uh, we are very excited about kind of what these changes mean for us. Right, Netflix is actually interesting, and if you think about it, it's both distribution, well, I guess they were initially just distribution, and now they seem to be getting into content. Is, is Netflix a company that you would take your talent to? Do you, in fact, are you taking your talent to Netflix? Yeah, I think they're, you know, they're definitely a real buyer now, but I think the main thing about that that was so successful is that House of Cards is a really good show. I mean, it's, it's A-level uh, quality, and uh, I think the, the, the point of this is that for us is, is to be focused on that part. But yes, I think Netflix is a buyer, Amazon's a buyer. And so that's only broadening for us. And uh, you know, our job kind of as a talent agency is to be in front of that and build those relationships for our clients, explain it to our clients, because the, the deal, if you will, for Netflix will look different than it does for HBO, mm -hmm. um, because they are different in many ways. So you have to be able to kind of advise your clients through the financial side of it, the creative side of it, and the pros and cons of that. And so. In that respect, that hasn't changed for us in mm -hmm. 50 years because it's no different when there was three networks and then all of a sudden cable channels came and started doing original content. That felt new and different to people then. And uh, so I think for our basic skill set, it's just a different application of what we do. Right. Now, you have a co-CEO who um, kind of has a high profile, um, Ari Emanuel. And uh, you know, I I'm sure everyone wants to know, what, what the hell is that like? Working with Ari, you know, I mean, Ari, you know, be probably the first person to describe himself as kind of a lunatic and uh, a very serious business person, but, you know, someone who just kind of runs around like crazy. I mean, I'm on the receiving end of the phone calls and the emails. How do you put up with that day after day? <laughs> well, Ari and I have been partners a long time. and uh, How many years have you been partners or known well, each other? For, for well, we've known each other. We started out, um, we both started an agency called Intertalent. And I was in the mailroom there, and he had just come over from CA and got promoted as a television agent. Yeah, he didn't treat you very well, though, right? Uh, no, he didn't. Uh, we had a funny beginning, but um, we became good friends there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in about 2001, I partnered with him in Endeavor. So we've been partners 
uh, in the agency business for, I guess, 12 years now. And I think the thing about Ari is he does get a lot of press, um, but he's, for his tenacity and kind of, he may be outspoken at times, but what's interesting to me about Ari is he's a phenomenal partner, super creative, um, unbelievably loyal, and, um, and not afraid of failure. So those are great things to have in a partner, and I think we have, we have different personalities, and, and uh, so it's, it's complimented, we've complimented each other pretty well this, for a long time, and there's no one I trust more. All right, well, not to belabor this, but I mean, listen, co-CEOs, any, with any two people is, is difficult. Um, but again, I mean, you know, he's a little unusual. So how, how do you guys sort of work practically every day? I mean, you, how do you make decisions together? Um, well, just structurally, you know, in your, when you're an agent uh, and, and, or a CEO of a talent agency, you kind of have, you know, three different uh, general skills or, or uh, job descriptions. One is you have to represent clients, so you're a day-to-day -day agent for a lot of people, which is kind of first and foremost to make sure you service them properly. Um, so we both have our clients and extended clients that we look after. Um, secondly, we have the agency that we have to run, and that we just broke up and had different divisions. So, for example, the music division will report to me. He'll be more involved with the marketing division. So we kind of like separated that out so that we could have the time to do it right. And then third, we work really hard on how the company should diversify uh, and grow without uh, damaging the culture of the company. And mm -hmm. I think that's the part that Ari and I spend the most time together talking about uh, because we're really proud of the culture we have in the agency. And any of the moves that we do going forward, whether it's bringing new people in to work for us or to expand into new businesses, uh, the first thing we talk about is how does it affect our culture? And if we think that that's gonna be problematic, uh, we won't do it irrespective of how tantalizing it may look financially. Or you mentioned culture. I mean, William Morris has been around for decades, right? And then you come in there. What was, what was the most messed up thing about William Morris? Um, well, it, it, it was just, um, I think the biggest thing at the time was they were in a uh, generational shift. I think a lot of the people that had been running the company um, were at the point where they're going to look to go do something else. And I think that the one thing that we were proud of at Endeavor is we had a very clear point of view about here's who we are, mm -hmm. here's where we're going, here's why we're going there, here's how you fit into that, and here's what the big dream is. And I think uh, the nice thing is when we did the merger, which is that was the biggest risk, was will people embrace the way we want to do it? And fortunately, when we went in there and we set that out, um, an overwhelming number were willing to say yes to it. And the ones that weren't, we quickly kind of like uh, showed them the door or they left on their own accord um, because we knew that from the start we had to get it right. So I think that one of the things that we did inherit in the William Morris merger was a lot of fantastic agents, but also specifically three really good businesses. They had a very strong music business. They were uh, very, very good at books and in non-scripted television. And we were not in the book business or we just started it in mm -hmm. a nascent fashion. And, uh, and in television, we had a non-scripted business that was thriving, but we were really more known for our scripted business. So the combination of those two in, in television made us, a, I think, the dominant player there. And uh, the diversification into music and books was really great for what we didn't have at Endeavor. So luckily, it's been really great. And we've had a lot of great kind of people who work for us who've kind of helped buy into what we're, what we're trying to build. So uh, I said we'd talk about Silver Lake. Silver Lake bought, what, 31% 30, of your company uh, recently. Um, I think we've had a dollar figure in, in Adam Lashinsky's article about, about that. Didn't we, Adam? We're trying to remember. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I uh, didn't mean to put you on the spot. Well, maybe Patrick can tell us what it is. No, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> um, anyway, what, what was that investment all about? Why did you uh, agree to let them invest in your company? What are you looking for with them? Uh, well, the first thing that we saw that was that because of, again, how we started talking this, with this conversation, the, the world changing so fast, um, and that we th saw that there's going to be opportunities for our clients to take advantage of potentially, particularly with technology changing, that we, we just needed more capital to do the things faster. Um, so the first start was, okay, what, what would be the right source of capital for us to grow? Um, what led us to Silver Lake, though, wasn't their capital, but was really their expertise in technology. Um, we're really good at content, 
and representing content creators and we think making premium content in all those kind of different areas that we talked about. But what we needed help is in, was in this very complicated world of how things were changing was someone with real discipline and expertise in that arena. And I think what there was is a kind of maybe somewhat of a uh, coexisting uh, ecosystem between Hollywood and Silicon Valley or maybe somewhat maybe of, of a distrusting mm -hmm. uh, perception on both sides. And I think what we found with Silver Lake and with Egon in particular was that we both saw that um, we needed each other. And they were, uh, it came very clear, they were gonna be the one, uh, was certainly we thought the best private equity firm to help us kind of like as this world changed, augment our skill set with that kind of, you know, kind of industrial intelligence that we needed. And then obviously a real good sounding board as we kind of think through these ideas. So it's been really, really great so far. And I think the great thing about Silver Lake is that they've, they've really embraced us and kind of we, we're weekly, daily, are in conversation with Egon and Steven and the other guys there, kind of thinking through ideas and, and uh, uh, working at it together. So that it's, you know, so far it's been great. And so they're sort of advising you on say what platforms, um, you know, make sense or have staying power, that kind of thing? Correct. And you know, what also is coming that we should be aware of. Also, when you look at a certain idea, how, how are you gonna be able to make money at it? Right. What type of capital is gonna to take to require to build it? What type of tech uh, expertise and people you would need to kind of build it out? So um, it's been very educational for us. But do you think Silicon Valley really gets Hollywood? I mean, you know, I've, see, I've seen this before. You know, in, the la in the 90s, there was some like meeting of the minds there. It didn't really work out with um, you know, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon's company. Um, that sort of really didn't go anywhere. And then, of course, money always flows into Hollywood and then kind of disappears, it seems. Um, do, do these guys understand what you're doing? Do they understand the business? Do they understand how the stars work, come and go, and all that stuff? I don't think they're as, as concerned about finding out how the day-to-day, -day, how we put a movie together, or how to talk to talent. But I think that they are really good at saying, you know, I think they look, at least I know Silverly looks at it as like, content's gonna really matter. Um, we have one of the, you know, probably two biggest platforms in Hollywood to work with. And I think that they both realize that this convergence of distribution and how you can get your content anywhere, anyhow you want it, and premium content mattering in that world, and advertisers wanting to be a part of all that. I think that marriage they know is an actually really exciting uh, business. And so uh, I, I have not had that same kind of like negative um, opinion of mm -hmm. Silicon Valley or the, or the other people up there that we've met. Right. I mean, are there any companies in Hollywood that sort of really get technology? You know, I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, you know, Netflix is an independent company, Amazon, to the extent that they're getting in this business, independent company. I mean, I guess you could argue that Disney has done a lot of stuff, but maybe through acquisitions. Do you see the Hollywood studios really, you know, embracing technology and really be able to create skunk works and have people really create you know, new innovative technology and platforms? I don't think Hollywood will be the place that innovates great technology, but I do think um, if people think that the people in Hollywood running these media companies underestimate their, uh, their expertise or knowledge of, of how they monetize their content, they're mm -hmm. sort of a mistake. And I think the guys, you know, at all the major media companies know what they have, they know the value proposition, and are gonna go make good deals. And at the times it's gonna cause things like you're seeing with Time Warner Cable and CBS today with that the kind of the battle that's going on between them about what is the fair price. And it's content distribution right there knocking heads, yeah. right? And that's inevitably going to continue to be part of it, but I think it'll be healthy. But I think the media people, I think we've, you know, are looking at we're good at making content and how do we be smart about how you consume it. And, uh, you know, you're, it's a, always a balance because the current ecosystem pays really well and is very profitable. And yet, you know, the world's changing. Right. So it's that, how you bridge that is really the, the trick. And I think, um, I think this, the, the executives in Hollywood have gotten a lot better at understanding that. Yeah, I mean, people talk about information technology and technology in, in Silicon Valley in general as being one of America's great industries and sometimes forget that entertainment is up there at the same level, very much at the same level in terms of being sustainable, exportable, um, and something that has a competitive edge vis-a-vis -vis other countries as well. Um, 
so it's it's interesting to me that um, that it's sometimes not not considered along those lines. I, I wanted to ask you about you know potentially a, a major disruptor in in this um, in this sort of area, and that is YouTube. Um, what's your take on YouTube, and and what are they doing, Patrick? Um, <clears throat> well, from our I mean, obviously, I mean the 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 traffic there is astronomical. Um, they have obviously got more and more in our world because of gone from user generated content to professional <clears throat> content. We have a bunch of YouTube channels. Uh, you have a bunch of YouTube. Yeah, channels. I think we have like twelve or thirteen different you know clients who have channels on YouTube. Right. And first and foremost, it's been a great creative outlet because it allows people to incubate and explore ideas online that they probably couldn't do in the kind of traditional forms of media. Um, and that's been, I think, the first place that a lot of the people that have a day job of making movies or television shows or music have, have, ex, have, ex, have uh, explored it. It's not been a, it's not, and can you see in the future where the YouTube channel is being very lucrative for those people? It's actually a great business model for Google, but, yeah. it, but it's not been a great, it's not a great business model for the content uh, creators. But at this point, I think most of the channels that we've created, that has not been the driving force of it. Um, the other thing is you are seeing some YouTube stars come up out of that. But I think for us at this point, it's been just a, you know, a great place to incubate different ideas. But YouTube is clearly going to be a major player going forward. And I think they will evolve. And at some point, you're going to see more expensive uh, premium content you know, uh, emerge there. Um, because without that traffic, you can't deny their their power. I mean, they have a big studio down in, in, in LA right now where people are, where they're sort of financing people to make things, right? Have you had conversations? Um, I, I guess the big problem with having a YouTube channel or one of them is just, just getting noticed, getting out there. Have you guys sat around and discussed that, how to market a YouTube channel? Well, I think the, the, that's the thing with any on the web. It's like discovery is the biggest kind of like, uh, um, you know, question. It's a challenge um, opportunity, right? Yeah. I mean, right. So uh -huh. it's, you know, I think Oliver Luckett's here. He's one, we started, we were an investor in the, in the audience, which is a company that helps in that area. So, um, but I don't think our strategy is specific to YouTube channels in particular. It's just about, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna put something out on the web, you gotta get eyeballs towards it. And our biggest challenge is that we represent celebrities and a lot of them with a lot of touch points. So the big, the big, uh, opportunity for us going forward is how do we how do we manage that and direct that towards the content that that we're creating or I should say our clients creating right. and that's evolving that isn't like some we have a clear answer on today but it's certainly a huge opportunity for us I mean say you had a young star come into um, your offices at WME and, and maybe he or she's you know been you know just you've gotten kind of a little hot you know been a been some, on some episodes of Glee or something, say like that, and gotten some recognition and maybe some Twitter traffic and maybe some YouTube stuff. What do you recommend to that person if they're a client? I mean, how do they, how do they pursue things? And is it different now than it was when you were starting out? Um, do you say, go, yeah, do this YouTube channel or like, do, let's just focus on social? Well, I think if you're, well, you're, in your example, if someone's looking to be an actor like in work in Hollywood, mm -hmm. um, and if they've already been on a few episodes of Glee, yeah, well, that's, okay, they're, probably, that's they're probably further along and they that's already That's why you're did. representing them. I mean, you wouldn't be representing someone who wasn't. Yeah, you would already be. But then the, once they're at that point, you actually would sell them mostly in the traditional way. You'd actually try to build them up in you know, the traditional movie and television business as you know it, because that's where it's going to be. That's their fastest way to success. They will now have gotten to a point where they are um, a known commodity. And you, they will get their at bats, if you will, to be able to make it. And that, so that that example wouldn't be it. You, you mm -hmm. do find I think you will see more opportunities where people will come from uh, the digital world and right. break in that way. Uh, it used to be you had to come to Hollywood. You would either come out of an acting school or off a commercial and hopefully get an audition and get in with a very small group of content or small category content and created. That's changed now, so you can. You can find ways to get your content made cheaper. The point of it is you've got to get it seen by people. So, do you? Uh, what's your take on cable companies, Patrick? I mean, are they are they dead? I mean, you know, with with HBO Go and their, you know, and Netflix and maybe Aereo, these companies that can bypass them. Um, 
What do you think about cable companies? I don't think they're, they're dead because I think part of the, the, the ecosystem today, you, you need cable channels, mm -hmm. you need cable companies. I mean, if you like Homeland, you, the current setup pays for that. And so um, I think there certainly will be an evolution over time. And I think the idea that if it's kind of, you know, the, the, the you know, prevailing thought of it's authenticated and you're subscribed to HBO and you can get it anywhere, mm -hmm. I think that idea works. But um, obviously they got their challenges, but I think anybody who says the cable companies are gonna be out of business uh, in the near future are, are crazy. Well, the same thing, I mean, they said the same thing about, you know, theatrical, the theatrical film business. I mean, the, you know, it's just gonna get, go away because everyone can just watch on their great giant TV sets at home, but it hasn't. I mean, it, has that surprised you that, you know, that there hasn't been the demise that people have um, envisioned? In the movie business? In the movie business. No, not at all. Because I mean, just was, how it's distributed, theatri say theatrical distribution. No. I mean, I think, well, you know, obviously it's changed over, so it's all going to be digital, and pretty soon it's all going to be, all the movies are going to be satellite to the, to the uh, various theaters. There won't even be the kind of digital print that goes around anymore, um, which I think will help from a piracy perspective and other things. But, um, no, that hasn't changed at all. I mean, you know, the, the, the movie theater is a shared experience. People want to go out. It's a social thing to do. There's certain movies, particularly comedies, some big action movies with the screen that are intended to be there. So I think that that will always be a mainstay. I think the mainstream uh, uh, film going experience won't change. You will see some niche programming that you can watch in your home. And there will be, and there will be, I think, uh, economic models that evolve that allow you to, to get a movie on opening weekend in your living room, that um, you don't need to see in the theater. Right. And I think that will evolve, but I think that'll only create uh, more opportunity for content creators and, and more niche type of contents. I mean, the biggest challenge film studios have is that everybody complains about the the, the lack of diversity and the lack of quality of movies and why is it always these big four quadrant things, but the the current, they would love to make a greater variety of movies. It's just the current financial cost of making them and marketing them right. forces them into a box, right? But what you're seeing is on the edges is that because of technology and, and people getting day and date releases and certain more niche content being able to be financed that way, is that that is gonna kind of fill that space. So uh, the film business to me is actually I think going to come through on the other side of this uh, in a really good shape once the physical DVD is gone, because I think that's one of the biggest problems we have from a controlling the rental window versus buying yeah. the content. Does anyone care about the DVD window anymore, though? Uh, well, yeah, a lot of people do. I mean, it's still. But yeah, it's a big fight because you know, it's a it's a kind of much deeper, more uh, complicated conversation. But you know, you have all the pay windows yeah. that people have paid for and a long-term licensing agreement. So. Uh, and the exhibitors care deeply about when it goes on DVD, and the studios care more about you buying the content than renting it. Right. But I think once the physical DVD is gone, uh, it'll help tremendously with the piracy, and it'll allow the studios and the content creators to control when the rental part happens right. and when the sell-through part How happens. How soon before the physical uh, DVD is gone? Boy, that's a good question. I don't know, five years? Right. Okay. I um, uh, wanted to see if there are any questions from the audience at this point. Got some, uh, let's see if we've got anyone. We've got one over here. And you have a mic. Hi, I'm Amy Webb, Spark Camp and Web Media Group, and actually you're my agency. Suzanne Gluck is my literary oh. agent. Oh, she's, she's a great agent. She's awesome. Yeah. So oh, I, yeah. She, <laughs> Whoa, Suzanne. She's a powerhouse. So I've yeah. just been through a year and a half long process of being represented and going to print and going through media and everything. And given what I know about technology and what's changing in the books business, I can't help but wonder if it's time for the agency model to, to drastically evolve. And I say that as a very happy client, I'm very happy with WME, but um, don't, do you think it's time to sort of um, rethink how things are done, at least in, in the sort of big publishing side? Yeah, I mean, this is, it's a great question. This is exactly, we talk about this all the time internally because you have now with e-books and uh, the opportunities that we do, should we create our own publishing unit and go direct? Um, and the biggest thing about the book business is how do you get people to know your books out there and, and to discover that? Right. And, uh, 
it is a, what's great about the book business is that the books, more people are reading books and buying books than ever as a result. Um, the challenge is if you're not a known author right. or have some type of unique kind of marketing budget, it, it is tough to get it out unless you just kind of catch on in some ways. And so it is the biggest thing that we are kind of faced with right now and uh, are working through. And funny, back to Silver Lake, it's actually a great, this is a great uh, example of something that we're trying to kind of work on together because whatever new solution you're going to have is going to have to have kind of the tech component to it that works, that allows you to monetize it, to build it, uh, and so forth. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll work it out soon. Well, it's like this whole thing about distributing content on the web. It's great. If you can figure out a way to make it inexpensively, you can make it inexpensively. Certainly distribute it inexpensively, but how do you build an audience? I mean, this is, we were just talking about that with movies and television and YouTube, and the same thing is true with eBooks, I think, to an extent as well. Other questions? Another question over here. A couple, in fact. They seem to cluster the questions. Hello. Stephen Wolf Pereira from Starcom Media Invest Group. You recently made an investment in Droga5, one mm, of the most good talented question. agencies out there. We'd love to know a little bit about uh, why you did that and where do you see that fitting into your portfolio? Droga5 is a hot new ad agency. You know, it's not that new, but it's a hot ad agency. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the kind of genesis of investing with Droga was two parts. One was, um, as we talked, with distribution changing, the importance of advertisers getting closer to what we do is essential for our clients and I think it's absolutely essential for the brands, right? And that has been being discussed for like the last, at least for certainly the last 10 years in Hollywood. Um, the strategic change that we made um, with the Droga investment, which is different than I think how we approached it and how the other talent, Hollywood talent agencies approached it was before we would have marketing uh, consulting groups that would consult on your Hollywood strategy. Um, and we found that to have frustrating results. And I think, you know, across Hollywood, I don't think the results have been all that particularly strong. I think it's an area that you can build a really strong marketing consulting business in sports because it's a different animal. But if you want to get closer to what we do, it's a little bit more complicated. And I think what we kept running into in trying to execute on that plan was one, the advertisers and the strategy was created so further upstream before it got to us with a brand, with someone on Madison Avenue, mm. that if your ideas didn't match up exactly or just by luck, you had a hard time implementing it. Two, uh, the inevitably created some type of like competitive um, position perhaps with the brand because the advertiser might, or the, the Madison Avenue company might look at you as somewhat of a, a threat. And three, to actually to kind of execute and implement A to Z, you have to be coordinated at the front end. Because as much as everybody talks about advertising on the web and where it's going, and I, I saw something uh, last week where it says, I think in, it's like $2.9 billion are spent on the web, and it's going to $6 billion in 2017. In 2017, it's going to be $85 billion still spent in television. So if you're an advertiser, that's still the kind of the heart of what you have to solve. So to us, those conversations predominantly were being had in Madison Avenue. So what we found with David was we thought he was the best creative on, on, on Madison Avenue. Uh, we thought his marketing company was really great. And he also saw that he needed kind of what we, what we do to kind of complete this A to Z solution. Mm -hmm. So what we're hopeful that we're going to be able to do is be able to create something that when you see it, you'll see that no one could have done this without these two companies working together in the way they did. And to kind of have an integrated kind of solution that starts with television to outdoor to online to television shows to music to books and kind of be out there and all of it kind of makes sense. The things that we'd run up against when we do something, it'd be a one-off and it'd be a one-time celebration of like, well, we did one great thing. But it wasn't a continued kind of like repeated part of their strategy. And that's what we're hoping this, that this will do uh, for us and our clients. Great. Well, our time is up. Um, we're going to have to uh, leave it at that. Maybe you can grab Patrick out uh, outside. Um, just, I've just got one last quick one. So Silver Lake's going to look for a return on its investment, Patrick. Does that mean you guys are going to go public anytime soon? <laughs> uh, no, we have no plans on going public anytime soon. With the emphasis on anytime soon, perhaps. Okay, please join me in thanking Patrick Weitzel, co-CEO of William Morris Endeavor.